Well, we're on our way through the Acts of the Apostles and we've reached chapter 19. Where last week we looked at certain self-made exorcists who travel from town to town doing magic. And seven of these men, all brothers, tried to cast an evil spirit out of a man in Christ's name. But instead they were overcome by him and wounded. From this point onwards, people began to show a great deal more respect for Christ's name. And other people who practiced magic gave it up and burned their books. The word of God then prevailed in Ephesus, as that verse 20 says. Great verse, isn't it? But Paul was thinking of leaving Ephesus and going back to places where he'd been before in Macedonia and Archaea. Macedonia, where the church at Philippi was, and Achaia is the place where the Corinthian church was. He wanted to go back to these churches that he'd founded and see how the people were doing. And it says he purposed in the Spirit. In other words, he was led by the Spirit in this matter, and this gave him the determination to do it. He was not only going to try and encourage these Christians, but rectify things that had gone wrong in these churches. He decided that after he had done this, he would then go back to Jerusalem. And then when he had accomplished that, he intended to go to Rome to see if he could help Christ's cause there. Verse 22 tells us that he sent two men before him into Macedonia, Timothy and Erastus, to prepare the people in those churches for his coming there. Timothy, of course, we know quite well, but Erastus we've not met before. And you remember that ch last chapter, Romans, was a long list of Christians who have done certain things in the Lord. He's mentioned there as a chamberlain of the city, so he's, he's quite a, um, a top man. This is Erastus. We know from the epistle to the Corinthians that a collection for the poor saints was going to be made uh, and sent to Jerusalem, which Paul would later take with him when he went there. However, there was to be a sort of disruption to his plans before he left Ephesus. And a lot of trouble came from out, from out of nowhere for him. And the reason for this was that so many people in this city had become Christians. And the word of God was growing. And because of this, uh, many people who had been idolaters were turning away from this. And it was Paul who got the blame. The great goddess of Ephesus was called Diana, but those who worshipped it became fewer in number. And verse 23 states that at that time there arose no small stir about that way, the Christian way, and many people in the city were getting stirred up about those who were walking in the Christian way. The man chiefly behind this disturbance was called Demetrius, who once again proved that the love of money is the root of all evil, and it still is. He was a silversmith, and he specialised in making silver shrines for the goddess Diana, and also medals and so on with Diana's image on them, like some of the objects worn by people today. When people came to Ephesus from far away to worship the goddess, they would purchase all sorts of silver trinkets and objects to take home with them, either as gifts for their family and friends or to their own homes to recall their visit to Ephesus. Needless to say, Demetrius and the other silversmiths made a lot of money out of this. They were onto a good thing. Indeed, the end of verse 25 suggests that not only did they make their living out of it, but they became wealthy. That word wealth is there. Well, religion has always been something to make money out of. Last week it was the exorcists, and this week it's the manufacture of religious objects. All over the world people are making money out of religion. And sometimes it's people who already have a lot of money who are seeking to make more. Christ was a very poor man. 
and yet many of those who claim to be his representatives seek to be rich. But God is never mocked by this. When Elisha's servant Gehazi tried to make money out of Naaman's healing, he was struck down with Naaman's leprosy. Whereas Elisha, the true man of God, refused to take the money, but the hypocrite made sure he got it. Thinking of this manufacturing of silver objects in Ephesus must remind us of the same thing which is going on today in the Vatican City, headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church and another place called Lourdes where, where people are supposed to have miracles done for them by dipping in a river. And millions of people go to these places every year and come back laden with trinkets and all sorts of things, filling up the treasuries of the richest organisation in the world. It's a bigger racket than there ever is at Monte Carlo or Las Vegas. And of course all those statues of Mary all over the world, some are huge, some are very small, but they all brought money to the Catholic Church. Now Demetrius had other men in the same line of business as himself, some of whom were subcontractors to him. He called all these people together and explained to them that people were not buying the silver objects so much as they used to because people were turning away from idolatry in Ephesus. And he placed the blame for this on Paul, who he said had brought the gospel to the city and said that they should seek to do something about it. They'd lose their jobs if they didn't do something about it. Well, that was appealing to the very basic instinct, wasn't it? People losing their jobs. Um, people trying all they can do to prosper in their employment. There's a great deal that a person will do to preserve their job. And they would go to great lengths to protect their employment. Not necessarily wrong in every case. Few men and women will accept a lower standard of living without uh, putting themselves out and without a fight. Many would rather do evil and become swindlers and fiddlers than take a cut in their income. <clears throat> Many an honest man has turned bad when his livelihood was threatened and the devil knows this well. There have even been true Christians who have made shipwreck of their faith through their desire to keep their worldly prosperity. The trouble is that when people let this thing get a hold of them, they can start going crazy like Demetrius here. They can lose their common sense. Just look at this man. He says in verse 26 that Paul had taught throughout Asia that man-made gods were not really gods at all. Now nothing could be more self-evident. It must be obvious to any sane person that if you carve out a figure from wood or stone or silver or any particular material, that thing doesn't suddenly become alive, let alone have the power of a god. But Demetrius was so blinded by his, his love of money that he was actually condemning Paul for teaching such an obvious truth. Demetrius believed that men made gods not that God made men. How incredible to make man the creator and God the creature. And yet that is how warped a person can get who is a materialist. Demetrius was actually bearing testimony to Paul's faithfulness if he did but realise that. He says that Paul had persuaded and turned away much people from idolatry shows how mightily Paul was used. In verse 27, Demetrius tells his men that not only are they in danger of losing their trade, but that the worship of Diana could be dishonoured and be thought, they, they themselves could be thought to be swindlers because if people start going against idolatry, they'll go against the people who make the idols. Demetrius is trying to get these men to turn violent against Paul. He even pretends to desire the honour of Diana. He says that he didn't want her to be despised, nor her magnificence to be destroyed, as if he was more interested in her cause 
than he was in the money that he got from it. What a liar he was. For when you think highly of any cause, you endeavour to give to it, not take from it. People are only in a movement for what they can get out of it, don't really have any love for it. It's the same with some people who go to church, they're only thinking of what they're going to get out of it. They may attend those gatherings which they enjoy, but they won't do much else. They don't feel responsible for the cause of Christ. Notice that Demetrius says that he is concerned about the magnificence of Diana, the outward show, what it looked like. For man-made religion usually is concerned with what the eye can see, the pomp and ceremony. He also adds that all Asia and the world worship Diana, so, so very many people that it must be right to do that. Paul was in the minority. He taught one thing, but most people believe the opposite. And that will always be true for the Christian. They'll all, always be hopelessly outnumbered. How often we are asked the question, how can you be right when you're the only one who thinks that way? Everybody else is opposite, and they all agree together that you're wrong. But then that only proves the truth of Christ's words. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there are that are on that way. Narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, of course, all this made the men angry. And in verse 28, they shouted out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. In other words, they proclaimed that they loved her so much that they would live and die for her and would defend her from anybody. After all, she is the goddess of the Ephesians, and we are Ephesians, so how stupid to seek any other god. Sadly, such an attitude has sent millions of people to hell over the years, because although missionaries went out to them, they were determined to stay faithful to the religion of their own country. Verse 29 tells us the whole city was thrown into confusion. For passions ran high, and everybody got excited, and this led to a panic. Now there was in Ephesus a great open air theatre, but the large crowd that gathered there couldn't find Paul, so they caught two of his companions and brought them to the theatre, desiring to make a spectacle of them. Some people actually believed that they were going to set wild animals on them as a spectacle. The two men were Gaius and Aristarchus who travelled with Paul from Macedonia, and their only crime was in being friends of Paul. So they were suffering for his sake. But Paul would rather suffer for their sake. And in verse 30, when he heard of their plight, he wanted to go to the theatre and give himself up in place of his friends. But the other Christians wouldn't let him go. He would surely have gone to his death, and that would have meant a great loss for the whole Christian church. It would seem that certain leading men in Asia who had become Christians were Paul's friends and they sent a message to him in verse 31 imploring him not to go to the theatre. It shows the concern that the early Christians had for each other and it teaches us that even the best of Christians can sometimes make mistakes and take risks and think of doing things which may harm them. It is our Christian duty to try and dissuade believers who are contemplating taking a step which may well bring harm to them. They may be acting from a good motive, but do they realise what may happen as a result? Verse 22 tells us of the confusion of the crowds some cried out one thing, others cried out something else, but most of them hadn't got any clue at all what was going on, and that's strange. They didn't know what the riot was about. They merely joined in for the excitement. Crowds always attract crowds. And you get a snowball in the winter and you roll it along the ground in the snow, it gets bigger and bigger. So it is with crowds. Now up until now, the chief enemies of the church were the Jews. And when they saw this uprising in Ephesus, 
they decided to cash in on it. So they put forward their representative, a man called Alexander, and he was going to show hostility to Paul as well. The Jews hated Paul intensely. But they were also against idolatry and against Diana. But they didn't want the Ephesians to turn against them at the same time they turned against the Christians. So Alexander was put forward to speak in defence of the Jews and to show that they were as much against Paul as the Ephesians were. But while he was trying to get the crowd to settle down, in order to speak to them, they found out who he was and that he was a Jew. And so instead of being quiet, they deliberately started shouting out all the more to drown out what he said. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. The only good thing about this was that it turned the attention of the crowd away from Paul's friends. The Lord using this to deliver his servants. But the whole thing was now totally out of hand and a tremendous noise was going on and it needed somebody with authority, somebody with common sense, somebody with wisdom to come and sort the whole business out. And this happened in verse 35 where the town clerk appeared on the scene. He was the registrar in charge of all the secretarial work that took place in the town hall and he was held in great esteem by all the different people. The first thing he did was to appease the people. He made it clear that he was on their side and by doing this <clears throat> he tried to calm them down <clears throat> and get them to listen to him. But then he gives them a short talking to, a strict talking to. He said, okay, so you're upset about something, but is this the way to go on about it? We've got a city to run. We've got people to be looked after. We can't have all this rumpus going on. You've been shouting out now, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So what? We all know that. We don't have to say it over and over again. We all know that. Everybody knows that the people of this city worship Diana. So I don't have to keep going on about it. We also worship the image that fell down from Jupiter. This is probably speaking about the idol itself, which they said had fallen down from the sky. It was such a stupid lie, and yet in no way different to what, what goes on today. I'm sure most of you know how the Mormon religion started. A 16 year old boy went for a walk. His name was Bill Smith. He came across, so we're told, two big plates and on them was written Egyptian hieroglyphics and next to them was a pair of spectacles. And when he put them on, the Egyptian words turned into English words and that became the Book of Mormon. And that's been going on now for at least a century and a half. Whether this town clerk really believed this himself or whether he was just honouring the people, it's difficult to tell. But it certainly had the desired effects on the crowd. He says in verse 36, as these things about Diana could not be spoken against, they all ought to be quiet. They should think carefully about what they were doing and make sure they did nothing rashly. Well, this is a good rule for all behaviour, isn't it? People should think through what they're doing before acting upon it and before acting rashly. not make any big decisions that would be rash you ought to be quiet he says well there's not much quietness these days I don't think people want quietness that much but it is necessary and that's why Christians have quiet times so as to get on their own with God and quietly speak to him the town clerk then defends Paul's companions in verse 37 what exactly had they done wrong, he says. They hadn't robbed churches, religious buildings. 
nor blaspheme their goddess. They may have different beliefs to you, but they're not causing you any trouble. Paul didn't preach against Diana directly. He realised that when a person turns to Christ in their hearts, their interest in false religion gradually goes away. This town clerk was separating the ordinary townspeople who had merely joined in with the riot from Demetrius and those who'd started it. He says, you people shouldn't have joined in, not knowing what it was all about. If Demetrius had a just cause, then he ought to take it to the deputies of the law and the magistrates. The law was open, the courts were open to hear anybody's complaint, and that was far better to do it that way than acting things out by mob rule. They could go and plead their cause and Paul could answer it. And if anybody else had a complaint, then they too should sort it out in the law courts. It must be done in a lawful assembly. That word in plead there means both sides can plead their cause, both have their say. We can see here the good sense in having national laws. We must also be thankful to God for any men and women in our land who are like this town clerk, people who, although not Christians, are nevertheless upholders of the law and wise as well, and like this town clerk are able to devise ways of keeping law and order. People who are sensible. The final thing that the town clerk said to the people was the most serious of all. He tells them in verse 40 that they were all in danger of being called into question for the uproar that had taken place. You see, they were not their own rulers. Ephesus was part of the Roman Empire and if the emperor's court got to hear about this, they might well take action against them, there being no defence they could make for themselves. They couldn't blame the uproar on others, they'd started it. What a clever man this town clerk was, to remind people that they would be held responsible for their actions to the powers that be. It's because there's so little emphasis today on people being made responsible that there's so much lawlessness. The cause of most of the Christians, most of this country's troubles is that people are not held responsible for their actions. We're all only too well aware of the uproars that have been in the streets of our land in recent days. We have riots, protest marches, the attacks on the marches by their opponents, the intervention of the police, People are injured, damage is done. And it's all happening because people are no longer taught that they will be held responsible for their actions and the law is not being enforced. However, those who were righteous should neither despair nor be frustrated. For if man's justice fails, you can be sure that God's justice won't fail. He's worked into life itself that whatever a person sows, they will also reap and they will be held responsible for their actions before him. People are in danger of being called into question for their behaviour by God. And what defence can they make? None at all, like here. It's totally their own fault. The last verse of this chapter tells us that when the town clerk had finished speaking, he dismissed the assembly. Well, that must have been a big thing to do, dismissing this assembly. There must have been hundreds and hundreds of people there. What a great man he was. How clever he was. He dismissed the assembly. He sent them all home and they went home as well. They knew that what he said was common sense. He knew that what he said was for their own benefit. Just one man against hundreds, but they knew he was right, they had respect for him, and it shows what a great man he was. 
So once again, Paul and his friends were delivered by God's protection. And in our day, we look to the Lord to deliver us, not so much from physical danger, but from false religion and idolatry. As the Apostle John said, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen.